I wonder if I should take my label off. If we're <laughs> advertising true. brands here. <laughs> Product I should introduce myself to Jeff, being, ah, yes. being that I'm a Duke refugee. Okay. Yeah. Your I have heard your name a lot. In lots of cursing going on all the time. Right? <laughs> Jeff, nice to meet you. You too. You too. I think you waited until the room mics were live to do that, Ken. <laughs> that was Ken Hirsch, everybody. <laughs> right, right. Believe me, I've said many worse things about various people in my time here not near the microphone. Well, at least I hope not near the microphone. We should probably give it a minute because some people will come in like right at, right at 10.30, especially if the keynote didn't get out until 10.15. I really wish I didn't know that. <laughs> I could just live in ignorance and be perfectly happy. No, don't sit on that chair. I think so. Reminder to repeat question. Yes. <laughs> nice to see you. That's awesome. Yeah, I know. Drive by. I keep, well, the, the, and of course, the recording starts five minutes ahead. So in, at the beginning of every recording, there's me. The wall seems either fun. <laughs> like, I need to stand up straighter. <laughs>
Okay, it's officially 1030, so good morning, and thank you all so much for being here. My name is Jennifer Behrens. I'm the head of reference services at Duke's J. Michael Goodson Law Library, and I'm also a lecturing fellow at the law school. I'm Jeff Saul. I am a systems analyst at Duke, primarily focused around Apple support and Casper, our end support. And just in case you're in the wrong place, this is Sync or Swipe, incorporating managed devices into law office technology <coughs> instruction. Um, just so we know a little bit more about you all, um, if we can get a quick show of hands, how many people here would primarily describe themselves as a professor or an instructor? Oh, okay. okay. Um, IT professional, like Jeff? Okay. Um, this, is, this is adjusting our level of technical geekiness, <laughs> I think. Um, where are my librarians at? Yes. All right. Um, we hope we'll have a little something for everybody, but that's good to know. You're going to have to do a little more heavy lifting, Jeff, get more specific. Um, well, here is the plan. The plan has not completely changed, just the level of geekiness. Um, I want to discuss briefly the history of the course that we're talking about at Duke Law, for which we incorporated these um, loaner iPads to the students all semester. Um, because it will give you an idea of how different this shakeup was for us, thanks to the Digital First Initiative that's developed at Duke Law School. Um, then I'll talk about what we did with the iPads in the classroom in the spring semester and what lessons we learned along the way, and we expect we'll have some time for your questions as well. So, the brief history. So glad Ken is here. Because he's part of the history of this course at Duke Law School, we have taught this uh, Introduction to Technology in the Law Office course for 10 years at Duke Law. It's a two-credit seminar that was originally developed by my current co-instructor, Wayne Miller, who many of you probably know couldn't be here this year, and also Mr. Ken Hirsch uh, there. And they originally taught the first two years of the course alongside Laura Scott, who's a reference librarian at Duke um, and who has a background in law practice um, as a, both a lawyer and a law firm librarian. I came into the play a little bit later when Laura decided that she would rather um, focus her upper level teaching on her business and company research course. So I've been co-teaching with Wayne uh, ever since uh, spring 2010, and we've been rolling along. If you would like some history of the course's development, I guess you could ask Ken. Um, and I should say, actually, we still pay tribute to the original trio of instructors through a conceit that we use in the course where we sometimes frame discussions and frame exercises as if the students are members of a technology committee at a small to mid-sized law firm named, what's that firm called, Ken? Hirsch, Miller, and Scott, if I'm not mistaken. Hirsch, Miller, and Scott. So <laughs> the spirit of our original trio of instructors lives on. And Ken and Wayne uh, wrote an article that was published in 2004 in the William and Mary Bill of Rights Journal, a part of a symposium on courtroom technology, where they discussed the the background and development of this course and perhaps um, of interest to anyone who does some instruction included a draft syllabus. So uh, a lot of this has changed over the years as you can probably imagine the specifics, um, trends, um, things that have developed, we've incorporated them in. But a lot of it still survives to this day if you can uh, see that here. So originally it was envisioned I think as a two credit, credit fail, pass fail course. Um, and attempted to kind of split the difference between hands-on uh, learning about a specific technology and also the sort of broader ethical implications, broader framework and perspective for thinking about technology issues and their impact on law practice. And we still do that to this day, although this is a graded course, um, unfortunately for me. Uh, the grades are drawn from three individual short assignments, which are 10%. Um, since there are fewer instructors here than we expected, I'll kind of buzz through this a little bit. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about one of these exercises in more detail, but as you can see, they're spread throughout uh, this, the course of the semester. This runs all semester long. And throughout the semester, the students are also preparing the bulk of their final grade, which is a uh, team-based group presentation to the, their peers and also a final paper. And so they work on this throughout the course of the semester, propose the topic, and commit pretty early in week three of the semester, work on outlines, work on their progress, sometimes change their topics. And the last three weeks of the course are devoted to student presentations where they present their findings to their peers. This is always a really interesting and rewarding part of the course. 
And over the years, you know, not to humble brag, it's worked pretty well. Um, we've had a pretty successful run in the last 10 years. 14 is our target enrollment. It is a seminar. It's very discussion heavy. Um, we aim for 14 students. Sometimes we get as low as eight. That was really an outlier year. Um, it's gone as high as 18. Tends to fill up pretty quickly. Uh, I think mostly due to the, the subject matter is high interest for the students. So we tend to have a lot of graduating 3Ls, sometimes all graduating 3Ls, um, since it's done in the spring semester. Every once in a while, an international LLM student is able to enroll, which is always really welcome to have a comparative perspective. Uh, and lately, thanks to more volatility on the wait list, we've been able to get more 2Ls, which is nice to have that word of mouth from year to year that there are actually students who take the class and then don't leave immediately after the class is over so they can tell their peers about it. Uh, we survey the students both at the start of the semester and then again later after they are alumni of the course. And the pre-class survey asks them to assess their technology skills and their comfort level. And that ranges really widely. Um, the self-described experts are quite rare. Uh, we usually get maybe one a year. They're much more likely to be, get people who say either they're afraid of technology, which we kind of threw in as a joke, but people do pick it sometimes, but uh, tends to be students that say, I'm okay at using technology, but I wouldn't call myself adept. So it's students that know there's more that they need to learn and are interested in learning more. And the course evaluations, um, I think, have been pretty positive. The reaction's been pretty positive. Uh, when we talk to the students afterward, as we're preparing the next year's course, we survey the alumni from the previous year to see you're out in practice, since most of you are graduating 3Ls when you took the course. Um, was there anything that you think we should add, anything that we didn't cover that you think we should put in? And so we really try to um, work around those suggestions. And you know, overall, I think we probably could have just kept rolling along doing what we were doing. It's, it's been a pretty successful course. But then, the Digital First Initiative came along and shook us up a bit. Yeah, so we just wanted to start playing with uh, managed devices or, or a one-to-one -one deployment style and just see if we could make it successful. Our goal primarily was to prepare the students for what they're going to encounter when they leave the law school, when they walk into a, a corporate environment and they're going to be handed a laptop, an iPad. They're going to say, you're going to use this piece of software. It's managed. This is our you know, this is what we're using here. You know, up to this point, most of the stuff that the students have worked with have been BYOD or it's been open source. It's been kind of have fun, do what you want to do. So we want them to work kind of more within the confines of, of meeting compliance if they were, were to need to. Um, we want them to be able to work mobily, and that was where the iPad came in. We'd like for them to be able to manage their data on the go securely, to be able to collaborate securely. And this is us. This is the uh, the DFI bunch. We got Dan Cantrell. He was our systems group manager. Myself, of course. Uh, Holly is our digital, digital initiatives librarian. Right, right. And then Wayne. So this, along with Jennifer, comprises the, uh, the team. The iPad Mini we went with. It was it's, it's a very mobile device. Uh, we wanted something that would be on the smaller side. We wanted something that is easy to carry around. It's easy to hold in one hand and work. It's something we would we hope we would encourage the students to keep with them and not you know throw on a shelf and only bring during class time. So we thought the form factor might might help us out. Uh, we knew we'd never replace the students' laptops or students' computer or their primary work computer. So we wanted something that would act as a companion, something that would. They could take out of a bag, they could quickly scan a whiteboard, scan a document, take a quick note, a picture, whatever they may need to do. Apple specifically, uh, we are Apple fans, we love our Apple products, but we knew we could support Apple. We've been using Casper in the law school, that's our MDM, for four years. So we've been deploying iPads successfully for the last four years. So we knew we could deploy these things with very little setup, very little support cost. Um, and 32 gig. Those were relatively inexpensive, uh, a good amount of size because most of the data that students were using were gonna, was going to be cloud-based. So they really didn't need a huge 
device. I'm supposed to show off the cover speaking yeah, the relatively the cover inexpensive. Five bucks and they were awesome. Five dollars so. on Amazon. <laughs> And yeah, they were excellent. They're very durable. That uh, didn't yeah, take too they much were of really a beating. Nice. Thanks and, to them. And they protected the protected them pretty well. So yeah. we may have to replace a few covers, but iPads are in really good shape. Yeah. So um, this is exactly what the students mm -hmm. what was planned for the students to be given from the pool. So I was working with um, a loaner device from that pool as well. So configuration. Um, we should say to the latecomers that uh, we surveyed the group and there are a lot of tech people here. So this part might be a little technical for yeah. some of you. <laughs> so we use the Apple DEP program, which is really, really cool. It allows you to pre-enroll the devices. It allows you to, um, it's kind of a zero touch thing. Uh, you can pre-enroll, you can set enrollment profiles, you can set bill profiles, you can do a lot of stuff there. So basically, as soon as these machines were bought, they were assigned to our class group. Um, that picked up Casper enrollment, that picked up all of our policies, the class group, so it immediately, out of the box, they're really ready to go. Uh, for the most part, you can unbox them, sign into them, and start working. So it's kind of zero touch for our, uh, for our support group. Um, let's see, what else? Sure, sure. I purchase a lot of Apple products for mm -hmm. uh, um, <laughs> I need to pay you guys. Um, through our e pro system, through our e commerce platform, mm -hmm. when I purchase Apple products, I've never been aware of this Apple DEP thing. Now, we, we are a Casper campus, we're not using it for local medical Casper footprint at UNC. How does one, because when we get an iPad for faculty, the protocol is. We can't do much with this because the first question when you take it out of the box is hook it up and assign it to your Apple ID. Right. I don't know what their Apple ID is, and I don't need to know what their Apple ID is. It's a personal device that we're going to support. Mm -hmm. We're going to reclaim if they leave the law school because it was mm -hmm. paid for through state funds, et cetera, and so on. But we have no way of configuring it initially out of the box. So we always have to just hand it over, say, hook it up to your computer that you're going to sync it to or associate it with your Apple ID, then bring it back, and we'll get the campus email. And we'll Get it on edge right. room and all that jazz. Mm -hmm. so can you tell me a little bit more about that DEP? DEP's okay, awesome. so can we, we're supposed to repeat the questions oh, and sorry. let me let me condense for the recording in case people at, uh, watching the webcast or the YouTube video don't hear it later. So I'm not sure if I'm going to do this complete justice, but it's right yeah now. to sorry. condense that a bit. It was a question about uh, using the the Casper and the enrollment um, to streamline provisioning new mm -hmm. devices. In your case, for faculty. Right because it's tied to a particular person's Apple ID. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. Um, DEP is, it has to be, you have to enroll. You have to sign up for it. So without getting really, really deep in the weeds in a, in a different conversation, you, you've got to have a corporate Apple, uh, kind of an iTunes account. You set up an iTunes account. You enroll through Casper. You have to purchase your devices through Apple or an Apple read, like if your bookstore is an Apple authorized reseller, they could be enrolled as a DMDP provider. If not, you can definitely take the steps to make it happen. Um, after that, I mean, it, it sets it up. It does everything. You can, at time of purchase, you have to purchase. When you purchase these devices, you have to purchase as a DEP device. Older devices can't be enrolled in DEP. Um, if you don't, Specify as DEP when you purchase, they can never be DEP. But once they're DEP, they are DEP forever. They are your corporate owned devices. And they can be manipulated at that point to be in any group. And, you know, it's really good for like remote users. So if you need to send someone in another state an iPad, you can pre configure it using DEP and just have it shipped directly from Apple to them. They boot it up, it does everything. School.apple.com, apparently. <laughs> Do another I'm going to ask the crass question. Sure. How are you paying for these? You're looking at me like I did it. Uh, well, that's a good question for Wayne Miller, who yeah. is the head of the Academic Technologies Department. It was something that I think they had planned for. Um, it has been in the works for at least a year, I, yeah. I would say, before the, the iPads were purchased for the loaner pool. 
they kept the loaner pool somewhat small. I mean, we realized, you know, we said relatively inexpensive, and it, it was. I mean, there's a cost there, um, which is part of the reason why at the end of this we wanted to talk about ideas for more mm -hmm. of a BYOD mm -hmm. to scale it either up. You know, if we were to scale this, what we did in, in our very small seminar class, into a larger uh, mid-size or, or even larger class, it, it wouldn't really be sustainable um, <coughs> from a, a budgetary perspective. So we'll talk a little bit more about that a um, little bit later. Do they come out of a pool like the General Library Loaner Program, or are they dedicated to this class? Well, it was dedicated purchased, more to the project, the, the digital first so project. Was, so you know, it was definitely kind of an exploratory uh, test project to see what happened. Yeah. So we should say, we, our class uh, was essentially the guinea pig in the Digital First Initiative. So the Digital First Initiative is something larger that they're hoping to make available to other courses at Duke Law School. Um, again, we'll talk a little bit more about that down the line. But so we were... I forgot to repeat that question, but it was about how, how much money uh, and how it was budgeted for. Yeah. Um, so is your Casper server, does it belong to the law school, or are you partnering with Central IT? We are with oh, Central IT. Tap, tap, tap. Okay. The question, I'm sorry. The question was, does the Casper <laughs> server belong to the law school, or is it a partnership with Central IT? We are with Central IT. We, we each have our own site and distribution point that we maintain ourselves. Uh, but then Central IT manages the Casper instance. Okay. All right. So, security. So yeah, security. <laughs> uh, we apply to security profiles. So once they were enrolled, we use Casper to apply our security and configuration profiles. If they were, we, we purposely tried to keep them as simple as possible to allow the students to use these as their own devices. We, we didn't want it to feel like a corporate or a managed device. We wanted to encourage them to use it, so it was real simple. We required a passcode, and then this was kind of a, after the <laughs> we'll fact. We'll come back to yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> um, but we had it turn off the display after two minutes and lock the device and require a passcode, and we enabled location services. So, so basically, we made sure they signed in to find my iPad with their iTunes account. Um, of course, they signed in with their iTunes account for their initial configuration profile. They signed into iTunes. They, we had a, a really small script in Casper that would auto configure their exchange settings. So they would log in with their NetID, and it would take it from there. It would associate it with, with Duke, and it would set up their exchange account for a mail contacts and calendar. And of course, it joined the Wi Fi network. We had to jump into there. Came fully loaded. It did. It came fully <laughs> loaded. So that was the next step. That was initially as soon as they unboxed it, as soon as they logged in, it started downloading all these apps. We tried to keep the apps all some things that were kind of cloud based, that were cross platform, something they could access from anywhere, they could use from any device, from their laptop, from a lookup station, from, from pretty much anywhere they were. Um, we were an Office 365 shop. So we had exchange tools, so we had them use our, our, that. They were centrally licensed already. They had a Microsoft suite, so we had them use that. Of course, everyone knows what Excel, PowerPoint, and Word's for, but we had them also use OneNote as kind of a primary mani note management, so <coughs> kind of a, an inbox. That's where they started with everything. Um, Lens, Microsoft Lens is a really cool app that does whiteboard scanning, document scanning, and it, within a couple of minutes, it'll scan to OneNote or OneDrive, and within a couple of minutes, your documents are OCR ready. So, so they're fully searchable within just a couple of minutes, which is really, really cool. Uh, OneDrive, we use that as kind of a personal data storage, so most of their personal documents or anything like that went into OneDrive. OneDrive is also really good for markup, for annotation, uh, with PDFs, you can really nicely edit those documents or write a note on a document or anything like that. Um, let's see. So Apple, we had Apple's stuff there already, so we used OneNote, uh, 
We use Messages and FaceTime for video conference, for telepresence, for any other communication stuff. Um, messages and FaceTime ties really nicely back into the gal so the students could find each other and could really easily go through some of their class exercises as far as video conference. You know. Jeff, for the, the non-techie people. You should tell them global address list there we go. <laughs> that's that that's the main reason we had everyone sign into exchange initially was for this very thing so that the gal so the global address list could be enabled and searchable really quickly i don't know that that many students used mail yeah. what platform are your students on otherwise what platform are the students on otherwise as far as email, for email. email. yeah they're using, they're using exchange they're on exchange they are they are on exchange. Uh, okay, and then we had Box. Box was for more of a corporate data share for team. Yes, to clarify for those of us who are really into the infrastructure, are you all using all of the same infrastructure? Are you all using Office for an exchange? Are you using hosted exchange on like part of Office Live, or are you still hosting students on Duke's platform? For no, we are using hosted exchange now. We've cut over to Office 365 for, for everything. Uh, box that was a corporate data share or a team sharing thing so any documents or shared folders were created there and that's sort of a duke approved yeah that's, that's uh, duke's preferred we have sharing. everyone every student gets a, a box account uh when they sign in so they've already got these everything so far is stuff that's already pre-provisioned and available to the students so they didn't have to go outside of that at all and then, you know, of course, we did our VPN services through Cisco AniConnect, and we used Ferris Print. We put those things on that form, too. All right. And then they also developed extensive documentation. Yeah. Um, set up um, for the initial setup, how to wipe the device at the end of the semester, since we wanted the students to do that before. Although you could also have done that right. for them. Right. Um, and several of the managed apps that we were planning to use in our course. So, and then in different courses, they would certainly develop other workflow or documentation PDFs. So the plan was to push these out to the students as they were needed through iBooks. Yeah, so what did we do? We did a OneNote annotation, we did scanning, we did video conferencing. It's really simple stuff, just um, we assume that they've never touched an iPad before and it's a really easy walkthrough for the basic stuff and then some tips or some extra stuff to help them work a little more efficiently. And so luckily for us, after our first class meeting, uh, it coincided with the end of the ad drop period because we did have, maybe I had this irrational fear that students would pick up their iPad and then drop the course and then we'd be like chasing them down all semester. So luckily the calendar fell in a way that we told them about the iPad plan at the first class meeting. Students were pretty excited. Some of them already did have iPads of their own, but they were still excited about the idea of having the managed device um, so they could do their classwork on that and use their personal for their own, for their own devices. Um, so we, we deployed them between the first and second week of class, and we asked them to go to the uh, academic technologies office to get them from either Jeff or Dan, who are primary people in the digital first group, um, had a little form that we worked up where they pledged to abide by all of the acceptable use policies and return it when we ask them to and care for it, at least as well as if it were my own. Um, would, you know, that's yeah. always kind of a dicey proposition because <laughs> who knows how well they care for their own devices, but we did get them all back mm -hmm. by the end. So that and was And we it. had them finger sign. So that was the first <laughs> lesson is right there at the end of class when we we handed them a digital document and said, finger sign this, use AirDrop, just give it back to me. So that was the first little annotation ramp up there. Um, and it was really, really fast. So the time that, that uh, ACTEC spent with the student was around 10 minutes or less. Uh, we handed them a newly provisioned device. We had already been, well, these were brand new, so they were right out of the box. They booted them up. Of course, we had already stripped out the EULA, the series set up, the location services, all that stuff was already gone. They didn't see that because we took take care of that with DP. Um, the only the first thing they would see was sign in. This is a Duke managed device. Please sign with your net ID. They signed in. It immediately in the background starts setting up their exchange settings. Then they're prompted to sign in to iTunes with their iTunes account. And immediately, we used that to authenticate the managed apps. So it was based off their iTunes account that would pull them down. 
uh, all the students had accounts, <coughs> so we really didn't have to get into account creation. You know, most people now have an iTunes account, uh, so we didn't have to get into a lot there. Um, once they were provisioned, we went into the Microsoft apps. We activated the Office licensing, which is basically sign in and authenticate as a Duke student, and that licensed all their Microsoft suite of apps. We took a quick look at Mail Talk Contacts and Calendar just to verify that it provisioned correctly and that everything was there. Um, spent just a couple of minutes looking at the device with the students, but they were all pretty pretty familiar with it, so that was it, and they were out the door in just a few minutes. So um, we encouraged the students to use it as they saw fit, you know, we required a few uses within the class, but we also encouraged them to download their own apps and really test the boundaries of the device and, and find things on their own, and we'll come back around to that in a bit. In the classroom, though, the major required use that we gave them was for that first individual graded assignment that was worth 10% of their grade, um, and that's the negotiation exercise. We use uh, uh, role play simulation instructions from the Harvard Law School program on negotiation. If they are watching, we pay for this every time. Uh, I don't know if they're as litigious as the business review, but just in case. So we do, we do pay for that. It's, it's a retail uh, sector negotiation of the terms of a contract. And so we ask them to actually conduct this negotiation online in real time and then write sort of a reflection memo on how the use of the online negotiation um, impacted the negotiation process. So things like, I couldn't really see body language as well. It's sort of thinking about whether a law firm might want to implement this sort of online um, negotiation in the future and what scenarios would it be appropriate or not appropriate. So it's always a really interesting sort of first exercise out of the gate. It's their first graded um, exercise. They're randomly assigned into pairs. And we've used different technology over the years um, to ask them to do this, depending on sort of what was the, the collaboration tool du jour at Duke. Um, we've done it on WebEx. We've done it on Blackboard Collaborate. And there's probably one more that I'm forgetting. I don't know if, did I get them both for when you were there? <laughs> Yeah, I've kind of blocked it from memory because, to be honest, the setup time for those previous ones was the portion of class that I, I dreaded a bit because we would have to get usually 14 different laptops configured, setting up microphones, setting up cameras. Uh, there would be sort of 20 minutes of feedback whining in the room while people got uh, their microphone set up. Um, it was always kind of, kind of uh, stressful for me. Um, but this year, because we had the iPads, we asked them to use FaceTime for the video portion on their iPad, which was something they were all pretty familiar with already, having, mostly having iPhones or other iPads in their possession. And then they collaborated on the contract document using Microsoft Word Online. So we asked, use this as a companion to your laptop and edit the document in real time while you're negotiating. So it was a little bit... Um, you know, artificial the way that we had it set up, but I will say the setup time in class went much more smoothly. <laughs> Actually, Microsoft Word Online was probably the trickier thing for students to get used to. Um, and the nice thing about it is, in previous years, when students would get stuck on technical issues, their reflection memos would become all about those technical issues. Well, you know, online negotiation doesn't work because my microphone failed, therefore I hate this, and we shouldn't use it as, as our mock law firm. Um, and that didn't happen this year. I think the worst we got was some complaints about camera placement, which is something that we could really adjust the instructions for, demonstrate how to figure out best way to place the camera for a, a more professional angle, I guess. So that was pretty successful. Um, in hindsight, I really think we could have done a lot more to require the use of the iPads. That was sort of the major required use, and we definitely suggested other uses to them but didn't require as much um, incorporated into the class. So we did some demonstrations using the documentation that the Digital First group had created for the Microsoft Lens scanning, which students thought was pretty cool, and also document annotation with OneDrive, which um, a couple students did kind of embrace and want to do going forward. And we briefly talked about the OneNote. I, I felt bad because they worked so hard on this <laughs> documentation, and then we didn't end up having a lot of time to really demonstrate it or show it. Um, I also tried to introduce apps throughout the semester. If we talked about a particular um, topic, I might recommend an app or two. If you'd like to learn more about mind mapping, like here's some apps you can test out on your own. But uh, in hindsight, we probably could have incorporated more. Uh, this was another existing 
exercise or simulation that we've done for a few years now. Wayne developed this really interesting uh, sort of budget simulation. Um, it's an Excel spreadsheet where students kind of tinker with the uh, budget numbers for technology and see the effect that the changes they make have on uh, the practice of a particular law firm. So um, it's, it's kind of elaborate. There's like four years of worksheets. So it takes you know, a good chunk of a class session. And um, so there are different pieces of the tech pie, the budget for the law firm. And you only, you have some preset percentages and every choice you make affects both the total of your budget as well as lawyer satisfaction, client satisfaction, the relative efficiency of the firm, and the risk level. So this is kind of a fun game that the students enjoy trying to win. Um, I call it Wayne's Kobayashi Maru because it's impossible to win this game, much like real budgeting in your organizations, I'm sure. Um, so, you know, you can make some changes where you, you purchase uh, a practice management system that includes timekeeping and billing. So you lay that out in year one and you no longer have to budget for the, and it sort of automatically changes the totals here. So he put a lot of work into this. Because we had the Microsoft Office apps on it, a lot of students use that to kind of tinker with it. Normally we'd have them sit in groups and one, one student is the primary person opening it and tinkering with it. So they were all able to play with it a little bit more than in past years. And it, it is a lot of fun. So I wanted to highlight that. Um, sort of random disasters befall you even if you're doing really well. Um, it's impossible to make the lawyers happy, I'm pretty sure. I've tried it a couple different ways. <laughs> um, so that was a kind of successful use that we hadn't anticipated, but it, the, having the Excel app made it easier for the students to play with it a little bit more. Um, I also was trying to model best practices by using the actual type of iPad that they had. So I had the 15th one in the loaner pool, um, and I tried to run uh, a Prezi. It used to be a PowerPoint about bad PowerPoint that over the years became a Prezi about presentation best practices. And so for the first time, I tried to run it off of my iPad. We have an Apple TV in the classroom. Um, I'm owning this. I'm on recording. I'm going on YouTube to say it was totally my fault that I completely messed up my video volume. And I scared the students off of doing it, I think, for their final project presentation. So I was very disappointed with myself. I know what I did and I won't do it again, but mm -hmm. I do think me demonstrating the Prezi, um, usually that leads to like one of the groups. We end up normally with seven groups or so for the final projects. Um, one of them usually nibbles at the bait and does a Prezi, decides to, to do that learning curve. And this time we actually had a Prezi majority in the class, which I thought was pretty cool. So I'll take credit for that and take mm -hmm. the blame for, my, for scaring them off the Apple TV. They all did it off the built-in computer in the classroom. Um, so we try to do somewhat regular assessment of how the digital first test in our class was going. We sent them a survey after the negotiation exercise to see how that worked out, whether they had any issues. Um, and we also sent them a survey at the very end of the course to just see how they thought it had worked using the iPads throughout the course of the class. And the online course evaluations that they get as a matter of routine at the law school, some of them mentioned the, the iPad stuff, but not very many since we'd asked them to do the surveys instead of the talk about that on the surveys instead of the course evaluations. And for the most part, I think students were pretty happy with using the iPad for what we required them to do. Some of them had some technical issues, but nothing major. Um, it was something that I wish we had talked about earlier in the semester because we could have told them how to fix the sleep setting. Yeah, that was um, by design. So yeah, I, I mean, it was sort of battery life versus, right. you know, <laughs> right. going to sleep. Um, there were a few that about, probably about half said they didn't really use it too much outside of class beyond when we told them bring it to class next week because we're going to use it for this exercise. And I think that probably correlated. We don't really have excellent data on this, but I suspect um, a lot of them were the ones that already owned a personal iPhone or iPad or a Mac laptop that they just didn't really feel the need to use the school iPad for much. But we did have a few that had said that they wanted to purchase their own iPad after the course was over. Um, one wanted to buy the iPad that we gave, which our policies prohibit us from doing, unfortunately. Um, so that was kind of uh, rewarding to hear that students were really inspired to look into getting their own device and, and learning more about it. And you have some numbers on how many other apps that they downloaded on their own, which was a pretty big range. 
minimum one, maximum yeah, yeah. 23. So Some somebody really, really went to town. And <laughs> Everything you could imagine. And the average was Great. nine. So yeah. students were playing with them a little bit outside of class. And we asked them what they were doing on these surveys. And so it was a range. I mean, some of it was the typical things you'd expect. I just kind of grouped them into, into uh, topics here. So communication was obviously a really big one. Video streaming was also a really big <laughs> one, probably, and music streaming, not surprisingly. Um, a large number of students were using it to read. Think, I, we said outside of our class, so some of them were talking about reading the readings for other classes. I started reading them online accessing the Sakai course management site that we use. Um, one student got really into art apps. They talked about animation and drawing. One was using it for stock trading, so I hope that worked out well for them. Um, <laughs> and my personal favorite, I just reproduced in full, the one who didn't really use it except to spy on their dog at daycare. So <laughs> I could have put that in video, I guess, but it was just too good not to quote. Um, technology lessons we talked a little bit about already. I don't know if you want to. Uh, Say more. Well, yeah, so, so some of the things I think we would have done differently is we were really involved in distribution of classroom materials. Uh, we tried to develop the, uh, the materials and we waited for a cue from Wayne or Jennifer to deploy them. So they were deployed via iBooks, which worked perfectly. Uh, we created an EPUB and it was really nice. And we used Casper to push them out. Again, it worked perfectly and it was really nice, but it, it was kind of a it was a weird kind of thing. We were a little too involved in the class at that point. So well, and we made it difficult on you because <laughs> there would be weeks where we were planning to do a demo and then we ran out of time because we're very discussion heavy. So some, we don't like to shut down student discussion if it's going really well. So um, we go, well, we're going to do the Microsoft Lens today after two, so do it after the break. And then we go, oh, no, we're not doing it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we ran out of time. So we were probably making it muddier than it needed to be. I think well, we could continue creating the materials. We could con continue to give them a really nice platform to distribute the materials. But we're going to let them do that from now on. We're going to either use Sakai or get them a little more involved in Casper. Uh, classroom and have them distribute themselves and we'll create everything before class leave it leave it for them and, and go from there and of course sleep setting was yeah a sleep setting that's an yeah. easy fix though yeah. i mean we can either change the default or right. tell them how to change the yeah. default if they don't like it and um, another improvement that became very obvious at the end of the semester was figuring out your mechanism for returning the ipads which you know <laughs> because this was the first time we had tested it we tried to be kind of loose and we initially said, give it back to us on the last class meeting. But the final paper was not due for another two weeks after that, during the final exam period. So some students asked, would it be OK if we kept it until the final paper is due? Which, since we were showing them collaboration apps and note-taking apps, and it seemed you know, reasonable to, yeah. to use it. So yeah. we said, OK, why don't we just make it to the end of final exams, which was a week later. And you could return it the last day of class. Now we had like multiple possibilities. You can return it the last day of class. But if not, you can return it during final exams. But make sure you get it to us by commencement ended up being kind of the thing. Yeah. Well, that was <laughs> maybe looser than it should have been. So we got one back on the last day of class, <laughs> which was, I thought we'd get like half of them back. Personally, I was a little surprised by that. Like, well, OK, great. They're using it. They really want to play with them more. Fine. Um, we had all but, I think, three or four back by the new deadline that we had set. And then we had to do a little bit of chasing people down and making sure. And we, we had one that went past graduation, but we did get it back. So now I am, I am the late holder because I was holding on to this for this conference, so I will get mine back. And eventually, they all came back. But it's something to think about, that it, it took longer than we expected. Yeah. There were some snafus about people coming outside of our normal business hours and expecting someone to be there that could take their, that could take their iPad back. So just sort of who can take them back, who right. can't, what time you can do it. Um, it sounds really obvious, but um, in hindsight, but it ended up kind of the time we saved at the outset of yeah. deploying the devices that sort of made <laughs> up for it and getting them back a little bit. So but with Casper, we could have been a little heavier handed managing these devices through Casper. We could have absolutely locked them out or shut them down or anything like that. But we, didn't wanna, we didn't want to go there. So. Yeah, not yet. But it may be. Denied them a grade. We could have, yeah. <laughs> I think. Um, the future success of the program was more important to us I think, than, than dying on that hill, really. I think it was much more. The fear I also had with the sort of initial form that they signed at the beginning was we didn't, 
really say anything beyond I pledge to return this when you're asked. We didn't say anything about a financial penalty, and, and that might be something to consider as well. But my fear was if it was too draconian sounding, there would be students that wanted to opt out. And because it was the first test case, it really wouldn't work if all but you know, one student is doing it. it. Oh, I'll just use my own device. Well, no, we don't want it to be a BYOD. <laughs> this time, we might do that in the future. But so there, there was a fear. Of, you know, we want to make sure this works the way we intend it to, and we might have to do a little bit more work to uh, to get things back. But you know, we we knew them all by that time. It was the end of the semester, so it, it just took more emails and shaking the trees <laughs> than we had planned on. But it was yeah. Did any get lost or were stolen? And how how do you What's your mechanism for getting that money back if one is? All right, so the question was, does, did any of them get lost or stolen, and, and what would be the mechanism for getting that money back? So thankfully, we didn't have to deal with that. We did, although some of them were late getting back, we did get them all back. Um, I think we had one that had sort of a damaged cord. I think somebody's dog chewed on it. It might be the doggy taker one. Um, <laughs> one that I think came back without the cord, but then we just had to remind the student to get that back to us. And one that came back without the cover, which was $5, so we're not going to worry too much about that. So I think it would be something to think about in the future if we're going to expand this um, for sure. Yeah, Dan. Since this class has been taught before, how much did the implementation of this particular aspect impact class and take up class time? Yeah, that, that's a great question, so I'll, I'll repeat that, and it actually feeds nicely to the next slide. So the question was, since the class has been taught before, how much uh, did the iPad incorporation impact the class content and class time um, devoted to it? And I think um, that was probably, in hindsight, the thing that we needed to do more of was figure out what to take away. We already had a full course. We had enough content without iPads to make a full course. And um, we tweaked some things so that the iPads made logical sense for exercises and things like that. But I wish that we would have, as the slides say, devoted a little more class time to just sort of discussing how they were using the iPads. Um, but it would have required us to cut some of the existing content. And we didn't, I think, do as much as we could have there. Okay, the question was, have we thought about using the discussion board in, in Sakai or, or somewhere else to, um, to discuss that and not use class time? We hadn't really talked about that. We do use Sakai for posting the readings, um, and um, we don't even really use it for assignment submission, although we could. But that might be an, a possibility as well. Sure, yeah, sure. Um, and that, that's a possibility. I will say um, the, last, the last week of student presentations, we had a little bit of extra time uh, because the students were all done presenting. We only had two groups going in that last week. And so we had about 20 minutes where we just sat down and talked with them about the course and about the iPad use um, and some changes that we're planning to make to one of the short uh, individual exercises for the company research exercise, getting their opinion on, on how one way or another might work. And a lot of them started to talk about the iPads, and I thought, this is really great. Like, this would be good to just set aside 10 minutes each class, but we would have to do some cutting. I, it really brought out some comments. It would have probably brought out this concern about the sleep setting that a, a couple students had. Like, if we had done that earlier in the semester, I think we would have gotten a little bit more interactivity. So maybe a discussion board would have done that, but I'm not sure. A couple of different, either sociological or pedagogical, I'm not sure how to approach it, but there's, ever since uh, Palfrey's Digital Native, um, there's been a, a large scale assumption in educational circles that students who grew up with technology know how to apply that in an upper educational or professional environment, and frankly, I think that's way, that everybody thinks that is way wrong and you're simply confirming that. Jeff, I take it from what you've said that although you pre-configured with policies, those were not, they were not tied down in terms of what they could change, at least like they could easily change the sleep time in a normal way. Right. Correct. So the next question that follows that is, in iBooks, did you leave the standard iOS manual available to them? We uh, did. So okay. if they had even bothered, so the next question is, <laughs> 
<laughs> I have to repeat these, Ken. You're on like three. <laughs> I know. I have to repeat them for the recording. Well, I think you picked me up on the mic. All right. People at home, you're on your own. <laughs> um, so, did the, do you think a key thing would be to tell them at the outset, look, there's an iBooks app on all iOS devices. Among the things, there are manuals that will answer most of your questions about using this device. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. Yeah. We did leave the manual, the iBook manual, and a lot of the workflows that we did were that style. A lot of the initial workflows were getting started using your iPad in a managed or corporate environment. Um, and we did purposely not lock them down because the, the iPad itself as a platform is very secure. When an app turns off, the app turns off. It's safe state, it's done. Everything's encrypted. It's, it's a relatively secure uh, device as is. But we wanted to be able to find them. So if iPad were stolen or were lost, we had to find my iPad so we could track them. We did have the sleep setting configured, too short, but we had it configured because it would lock the device. Um, as far as the students, they were familiar with iOS. Most of them, again, have, have had an iPhone or have an iPad or something, but they were using them as, I don't I want to say toys, but they watched a lot of Netflix and they did a lot of fun stuff with them. But this was to show them that these are actual, mm -hmm. these can be an enterprise level device. This can be used. I, I live and die by mine. I use it every yeah. single day for work. Uh, and we wanted to show them how to do that because, yeah, there's a chance they're going to walk into to, uh, their career and someone's going to say, here's an iPad. You know, can you use it? Are you, you know, do you know how, or even a not, even even a, any managed device. Any managed yeah. device. Do you know what box is? Do you know how to collaborate with someone? Do you know how to secure your data? And can you do this and still stay within the confines of our security and remain compliant with us? Um, oh, okay. <laughs> We have a few more. We promised to talk about scaling, and that's next. So um, we still have a few minutes. Why don't we finish the slides, and then we'll, we'll leave some time for questions. Since we did promise you scaling, and we've already talked a little bit about the budgeting. So right. here, here are some of the ideas that, that we've come up with about maybe moving this more toward a, a bring your own device model, which I think would be possible. I think it would be doable, given that we did have some issues with sort of the iBooks not always pushing out right. to everybody. Um, it might have been easier to just say all of the readings, all of the yeah. documentation, like everything you need is on Sakai, and you can use your iPad to get on Sakai and do that, um, or you can use whatever device you have. Like uh, to me, I think it would be doable. Mm -hmm. I think it would where you would trade off the sort of hard cost of budgeting for a loaner pool mm -hmm. of iPads or a particular device that you choose would be adapting the instructions to accommodate different types of devices and different types of uh, operating systems and also the support sort of by right. the tech support on that end. So um, I think you would still need a supplemental loaner pool if your institution has one for students who, students who do exist without a particular device or even a laptop. I think in our case, all of our students had laptops. Not all of them had tablets. Some of them did, some of them didn't. Uh, at least one did not have a smartphone. So, I mean, we, were, we really had a spectrum. Everyone had a laptop of some kind, not all Macs. So we would have had to accommodate right. different types of, yeah. of computers or devices. Um, and we may have to think about that for our course in the future because the Digital First Group is looking at possibly getting other um, courses on board to find different ways to incorporate the iPads into their instruction. So I think right now they're looking hopefully for a clinic mm -hmm. or doctrinal um, professors who are very interested in technology and willing to think about taking this on for their course. They're hoping to get some other courses on board for fall. Although if they're not able to, they may have somebody that will commit to the spring and then in our class we'll have to think about you know, ways that we might do some of these same exercises but not with the pool because we would obviously step aside to let somebody else do it. So if there's no one else on board, we'll do it again and probably carve out more class time um, and see how that works out. But um, it, it's been a really fun, mm -hmm. fun adventure. So now you get to choose your adventure. I know we already had a couple <laughs> hands up. <so. laughs> we have a few minutes before lunch, so I think you can end up. Students bring their own device. Can you add it to the management if they have a better screen or more 
Solutions. Casper can manage, uh, iOS, Casper can manage personal devices. So you can create a personal device profile within that particular MPN. It, it's very limited with what it can do. It, it essentially will only manage things like um, issuing software or VPP software that we may have purchased and pushing iBooks. We can't configure any settings. We can't really pull many metrics, uh, but we can do the most basic steps in managing, managing personal devices. All right, and Doug, you have your hand up. Yeah, um, I'm curious, and this gets outside of the use of the iPad a little bit, but uh, we taught a very similar course in Carolina, modeled greatly after Ken and Wayne's original template. I co-taught it with a law librarian in the spring of 2015, and we're going to be teaching I'll be teaching it with another person in the spring of 2017. One of the bits of feedback that we got from students when all was said and done was that, like you guys, we, we devoted a, a fair, a significant portion of the last few weeks of class to these student presentations. We did not, however, allow them to do it as groups. It was, it was every student in the class, so there were still about 14 people. They went on forever. <laughs> I mean, it was like, because the class only met twice a week. It was a 55-minute class. And it just seemed like to schedule that many students and to give each student even 20 to 30 minutes, so two students per course or per class meeting. So like the last three weeks were devoted to these student presentations. People just got bored and tuned out. Mm -hmm. As much as it was interesting what different people chose to research or present on, you know, they had to write a paper on it too. So they, they devoted time to getting their papers done in it on time. Then they had to do a presentation, and a lot of the student evaluation said, we wanted more hands-on practice. This is a course called Law Practice Technology. We wanted to do stuff. We didn't want to be lectured at so much, mm -hmm. and we didn't want to hear from our, our fellow students. I'm just wondering if you guys heard any of that from your feedback. Okay, so I'll, I'll restate that. I think that's actually really two, two questions slash comments. So um, part one was um, in your course at UNC, you have the students do final presentations, but as individuals and the scheduling it, it goes on for a long time and the students tend to maybe react not as positively, um, sort of fade out after a while. Um, and the other, uh, well, let me do that one first. So I think, I think the group project really helps with that. We end up normally with about seven groups and it's spread out over three weeks and we basically tell them plan for 20 and then you'll probably have 10 minutes for questions and if there's only two groups going that week you might have a little bit more time our students have responded really well historically to the the final project presentation i think part of it is we ask them to commit to their topic pretty early in the semester that's um, basically by week three they know who their partner is and they know what they're doing and so they're working together throughout um, and we also try very hard to um, make sure that the topics don't repeat too much and sometimes there's just you know three groups that want to do the same thing and, and you have to kind of filter that a little bit so we try very hard to say not only is it something that you know is not already on the syllabus that we're not going to cover in depth um, we want to make sure that your presentation isn't too similar to somebody else's so if two groups um, historically the, the hot topic for a long time was social media this year it was it was supplanted by AI so we had normally it was like three groups that wanted to do social media three that wanted to do e-discovery and then we'd have to finagle with all of them like you can do social media in the law office you can do it in litigation and you can talk about the other in your paper but you know don't do it in the presentation because everyone will just want to gouge their eyes out with a pencil so um, you don't want to hear six on the same thing so that helps a lot, I think. Um, that helped a lot. Maybe it was the group aspect of it that we were missing that would be helpful because then you feel a, a little bit more investment. If, ever, if there are, you know, instead of 14 individual presentations, if there are even six or seven. Seven groups, I think, would be much easier. Uh, it would probably still take you three weeks. With the group project, you want to make sure that they have time for all the members to speak. Right. And we prefer pairs. I think when we've had odd numbers, we've, we've occasionally had trios. And that, it just tends to be more difficult, I think, for everyone to be heard and to really contribute when you're doing a 20 or 30 minute presentation of three people. Um, it, it tends to be very shallow, I think, what, what people are able to say in that amount of time. So, um, but I really, I like the group aspect. I think it's appropriate for them being future professionals where they're probably gonna work on team projects, you know, no, what, no matter what they're doing. Um, so I think the students have been pretty positive about it because we try to spread the topics pretty widely. A lot of them bring experiences from their summer work. 
Um, this year we had a group that talked about uh, contract automation that was based on some of the work they had done in previous summers and got very excited about certain softwares that they demonstrated. And, and uh, you know, it was, it's always like the students learn a lot from each other. It's probably my favorite part of the semester, to be honest. So, okay. Sorry. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to rain on the parade a little. That's okay. In, in law firm land, um, yes, if a firm is a firm that gives out things, they will give an iPhone or an iPad or whatever because it is so easy to control. If it's bring your own device, which is what's happening more and more and more, first, you bring your device, they have certain requirements, and actually they succeeded in changing my device from a more secure to a less secure. <laughs> I had the fingerprint thing, all that stuff, and it went, they, I had, then I had got a four digit number. Well, I went to six. But, um, and two minutes. No, we time out way before that, <laughs> for requi required. <laughs> we time out at like a minute. Um, and also, this is all wonderful, but I see all these Macs around here with all you wonderful, wonderful law school folk. Law firms love iPhones. They don't love Macs. <laughs> They're, it, it, you, it, it is a special, special firm that you're going to get into that has Macs. Um, so I, I would hope that there's a lot more emphasis on saying that Yes, this is an idea of what law practice will be, but yes. here are, you know, Skype me in. Right. Well, no, that's that's a great point, and it actually speaks a little bit to the second part of, of Doug's comment earlier, which is the, this idea of you know students wanting more hands-on practice, and that's one of the things that we really try to emphasize at the outset of the course is like this is meant to expose you to sort of the implications and the the general ideas. It's, we go much more for breadth than depth because we don't know what they're going to have out in practice. Most of our students go to big law settings where you know we can sort of make an educated guess about what they'll be using, but we just don't want to spend, you know, too much class time really focusing on a particular, you know, practice management system or case management, yeah, and then they the use something concept. different. We'd yeah, so I think it's much more about the concepts, yeah. yeah. And some of what we do is, you know, if we move to a BYOD model in the course in the future, it would be because it would be more convenient for us, not because it's realistic, and we would tell them that for but sure. But it would actually yeah. be more realistic. Well, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> we might have to edit the tech pie to, to uh, yeah. <laughs> include BYOD in the security risks. And Ken? Although, yeah, and you've only got one semester, and even in that, you only have them once or twice a week, so there's, there's only so much reality you can inject. <laughs> um, and my main point here is, in our course of the now to get us closer to meeting all the new ABA requirements, I've listed like half a dozen, of close to a dozen of my learning objectives for the course. But my overarching learning objectives are really just two. One, to be aware of the RPC and how it interrelates with technology use. And two, simply to know what questions to ask yes. when they get out there. Yeah, so if, if, I, if we are able to help them Think more about it. Be aware of ethical implications. Um, be aware of what's emerging. Um, we feel like we've done yeah. what we can. So I just want, I think we're getting close to lunchtime, and I know um, some of you may want to split, and that's fine. But um, we can stay a few more Should minutes. Take if, one very simple question. Okay. Well, Kim actually had her hand up. Um, so speaking towards the lawyers with the devices, for the last five years, every spring we do what we call a technology boot camp like third year students to come and they're real practitioners that come in and talk about technology that they're using in their practice. And every year we have a local prosecutor, or, and it's not always the same one, come in and with his iPad and show the apps that they're using in the courtroom. And so this past year, um, there are some really, really cool ones. One's called like TrialPad, and these apps are not inexpensive. Um, and yeah. so we would not want you know, we don't expect our students to spend 130 bucks on that. But um, just this week, we bought a bunch of these uh, apps because we can get them at half price through the MVM. And we will look to push them onto um, both our letter iPads and look into a bring your own device. If you do. So, because we actually make them sign an agreement. If you lose it or break it, you owe us the cost of that. Yeah. And I should say, um, 
So that's one thing we do um, in the separate loaner pool, mm -hmm. the yeah. sort of signing an agreement about being on the hook for the cost. So the, the original comment was um, about having uh, practicing attorneys come and do a, a boot camp for, for students where they talk about specific apps and technology that they're using. And it also sounded like your trial pad is currently available through the MDM at a There's discount? A bunch. Okay. So We um, so we occasionally in the class demo um, certain apps. Usually we try to get ones that the students can test on their own. So things that are available through Lexis, for example. Um, so that is that is a barrier that a lot of the practice apps do cost money, and it's um, something we might have to look into if we were to keep working this way. All right, and then Dan, and then we'll do one more. What's your credit hour allotment for this class? The credit hour allotment is two credit hours. We meet once a week. Um, and are you asking how much time I spend, like in terms of prep? No, or, or the, in the class time. Oh, in class time is uh, one hour 50 minutes, I believe. Close to two hours. Just a quick comment. Um, we had surveyed our students in, uh, a year ago, I guess, and said, um, what aren't we doing that we could do that you want us to spend your practice money on, right? And so one of the things that came up was, we have loaner laptops, um, loaner iPads. So we purchased two of them, put a trial pad on them, made them available. I sent, them, sent the information to the law practice management class and it's all over to the students who were not checked out one time during the school year. Wow. Not once. And trial pad, I mean, I would think that for some kids that would be not affordable. Right. So, yeah. Yes. So I'm still now I'm thinking I'm going to give these iPads to faculty because the students are not interested. I don't know that, it, that, that they're not interested. It's that it doesn't uh, it doesn't give them a grade in any way, which is you know I, I mean I mean it, that's an extracurricular. That and I wonder um, related Jeff, can you speak at all to the the separate loaner program that we have? Because um, we we have uh, I mean they do get used. But. They get used. Uh, Usually, they are used as a replacement if a student loses their, yes. their, their personal iPad or, uh, you know, if they need to do something very specific, uh, mobile, that they can move around with. Um, I'm not sure. I, I think it's a little bit of a learning curve, too. I think a lot of people look at these things and say, well, this is great to play games or watch Netflix on, but that's well, we it. We really push the fact that we put a lot of legal apps on. Right. Right. Yeah, I mean, that was the whole purpose of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we've managed to, in circulation for years, and they get checked out four or five times a year and come. This sounds like a very interesting program proposal for next year's Cali Conference, <laughs> if anyone's interested. But we should let you get to lunch. So thank you so much for coming. If you have questions, please get a hold of us. Yep, thank you. I did remember because, oh no, I'm glad you're here actually because that is actually a question we had sort of from the powers that be. appreciate, you know, and I know there's no way to do it. I mean, I'm really thanks for coming. I know they're personal apps, but it's not how law is done now. And we have um, guest speakers for it should be three of the weeks, but they usually can, they speak for half the class. So, and then three of the weeks are student presentations. So, they sort of go up and down. It has to be something that is. And it really is. I mean, it's really like kind of fun. I really enjoy that. My class, I think it's great. 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 And I think about and how to do it takes support for a lot of people. So I'm okay. okay. That's okay. Thanks. Um, but the thing is, like, we've only been doing it. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it's ours is like the right amount of time to really uh, talk about now. what we're trying to do. And yeah, you, 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 you must, within some, like, like two hour period of understanding that you've lost it, you have to call IT and they will wipe it out immediately. And so, that actually.
Great job to, for the both You're of you. You're just saying that because I put your picture on the screen. No, 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 it was very good. Thanks for contributing, I, I, Hirsch, Miller, and Scott. Oops. Shout out. I mean, that's, a, that's something that I would they Great still, job. They yeah. still Thank can't you. spell your name, I'm sorry to yeah. say. Neither can the people who I work with. Nobody can spell my name before. Yeah. No, no. I appreciate this. It's, yeah. You know, it's, it's always good to hear what but, other folks yeah. are doing. Yeah. But I do think it would be an interesting thing to add, even just for a short a short piece is to have somebody in, I, in a law firm, yeah. tech, you know, or librarian or who, mm -hmm. um, one of the lawyers, whatever, talk about what it, that, first of all, how they use these sorts of yeah. things, and then second, what their limitations are, because, I mean, the yeah. Yeah. And I realize, we, I didn't say, I should have said that we do have some guest speakers, like, sprinkled throughout the year, but we don't have sort of law from IT, and that might be, so we have, we have a practicing attorney, we have actually some e-discovery vendors who speak, um, and we have uh, Fred Letter of the courtroom, the William and Mary courtroom of the future, you know, talking about courtrooms, and he's great. Um, so it's, it's a good spread, but that would be a good addition, I think. If you know somebody that would be willing. <laughs> okay. Um, is really into that kind of stuff. Okay. He's real sport. Or just contact Delta. Oh, yeah. And say, yeah, yeah. and say, you know, and really, anyone who works, who brings their own guys, or works within that system, mm -hmm. would have a opportunity to be able to tell, I mean, yeah. I can tell you a lot about what I have oh, yeah, to do absolutely. to keep it and that was part of the reason, locked. like losing losing Laura Scott from the class was um, that she had she experience. had law firm experience, yeah. so she mm -hmm. was really able just to, both as an attorney and as a librarian. Like yeah. she had that sort of yeah. I've been in a firm for you know a decade or whatever, yeah, yeah. and I don't have that, so yeah. that's it's hard. But so. we we kind of have the students fill in a lot of the blanks mm -hmm. because they're usually three L's who have done a big law right. summer and but they didn't yeah. get a, they, didn't they don't get, get the full bill, yeah, yeah the they don't get all that. And, well, some of them actually said they did. Interesting, yeah. It surprises me how little some of the folks who've done okay. those summers, <laughs> how little they have taken in about what is going on around the them. The only thing <laughs> they know is that yeah. they had to put yeah. their time in, uh -huh. and they didn't like it. Yeah. Yeah. Be Even though ours have secretaries, so they actually still <laughs> fill out paper timesheets. Yeah. Which I'm like, really? Oh, yeah, no, yeah, yeah well, no. I I've always kept mine in a spreadsheet, and I, I will send them my template, which is... Entered, date, or entered, date, matter, who, you know, time right. entry. Right. So that all I have to do is cut, paste, cut, paste, cut, paste, done. Right. Like, I don't have a secretary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the seed uh, for, for the digital first thing is, at least for me, is because I did come from corporate. And, mm -hmm. and I've never worked in education. And that was, initially it was not, well, let's deploy iPads. It was, how do we prepare these kids for when they walk into a... Mm -hmm. and, and the things that I want are, you know, they need to get the, the grounding in the Word, Excel, Outlook. Yeah. But then they only need a concept for yeah. everything else. Right. Because it is. I mean, it's just so difficult. It's so difficult. <laughs> That's what we try to have. So we, we yeah. try to, like... But yeah, that like needs to be. Yeah. Oh, no, word needs to be. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll have more to say about that on, on Saturday morning. Yes. Um, yeah. And, and just, just the decision. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. There's so you much only have so much time. Yeah. And if they're not getting the in the totally, there's no thousands. Also, you know, I'm just thinking about the 
need so many litigants. Yes, <laughs> it's like, yeah, can I mean, we, I mean, can, I mean, we can't, can you know, we can't, you know they, these are dead. Yeah. <laughs> they don't play anymore. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, and then also, the, when